In this month's critical care video, we'll be discussing the mysterious case of the rising creatinine. The case starts off with an 80 ish year old female brought in by EMS from a nursing home for acute kidney injury. She's had decreased urine output and increased creatinine despite IV fluids for the past two days. The patient has no complaints, such as pain or shortness of breath, however, this is limited by her dementia. Her blood pressures are slightly soft at 90s over 60s, but we were told this is her baseline. Her past medical history includes diabetes, hypertension, and dementia. Her baseline creatinine is 1.5. The patient arrived at the end of the previous doctor's shift. The previous doctor did the history and exam, ordered some labs and some more fluids, and told the oncoming team to follow up the labs and admit her to the hospital. The labs return, and the creatinine is 5.3. So how can we use point-of-care ultrasound to determine the etiology of the acute kidney injury? For the purpose of this lecture, we're going to break up AKI into pre-renal, renal, and post-renal causes. Starting with post-renal causes, this is the one that ultrasound is the best at. Usually it includes BPH, urethral stricture, or bilateral ureteral obstruction, and ultrasound can quickly find the etiology of this by doing a post-void residual or looking for hydronephrosis. Moving on to the pre-renal causes of AKI, this one's a little bit more challenging, and ultrasound is used to evaluate the volume status of the patient to determine if they have sepsis, hypovolemia, or impaired cardiac output leading to poor forward flow. And then finally, the intrarenal causes of AKI are very difficult to determine, and ultrasound is not helpful in this case. So in our patient, we look for the post-renal causes of her AKI. We started with the bladder ultrasound looking for her post-void residual, which was normal as seen by the video of the sagittal and transverse views of the bladder here. We also did a renal ultrasound, which shows no hydronephrosis, but that's not seen here. Moving on to the second POCUS evaluation for pre-renal acute kidney injury. This is gonna be evaluation of the patient's volume status. I like to think of this as two different levels, either residency level or fellow level. The residency level volume status evaluation will be looking at the IVC to determine if it's fat or flat, as well as looking at the lungs to look for B lines, which indicates that there's interstitial or alveolar fluid. If you wanted to move on to the fellow level volume status assessment, this usually entails advanced echo, which we're gonna be discussing RV size and function. However, you can evaluate for diastology, but that will be saved for another lecture. Here are different views we obtained of the patient's heart. Starting on the left is the parasternal long axis view. You'll notice here that there is a trace pericardial effusion. The left ventricle appears to be contracting normally, so it has a normal left ventricular ejection fraction. However, the RV looks a little bit generous. If we move on to the parasternal short axis view in the middle, we'll notice that the RV is very large, and it actually is flattening the interventricular septum and causing what we call the D sign on the left ventricle. If we look at the heart in the apical four-chamber view, we'll notice that the RV is very large, bigger than the LV, it's severely dilated, and the function is compromised. When I mention that the patient's RV function is compromised, what do I mean? Well, I'm talking about the RV systolic function as measured by something we refer to as TAPSI, tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion. It's the concept of how well does the tricuspid annulus rise during systole and relax during diastole. We measure it with M mode through the lateral wall of the tricuspid annulus, and you'll notice here when we measure it, it is only five millimeters. Anything under 10 millimeters is severely reduced, so we know this patient's RV function is severely reduced. In our final advanced echo view, we'll be looking at the RV inflow view. This uses the same parasternal long axis window However, now we're tilting the transducer tail up higher, which brings the viewing plane more anterior, which if you remember, the RV is the most anterior structure. And so now you can see the RV, the tricuspid valve, and the right atrium, and there's a significant tricuspid regurgitant jet. If we measure the tricuspid regurgitant jet with a continuous wave Doppler, you'll notice that we can get a maximum velocity of around 3.86 meters per second, which is quite fast. And if you plug that into the Bernoulli equation as seen here, you get an RVSP of 76, which is severely elevated. We know the patient must have chronic RV dysfunction because the RV cannot acutely make a pressure over about 60 millimeters of mercury. And being that her RVSP is 76, that means that a chronic process is occurring. There could be an acute process on top, but we know that the RV is chronically affected. 
A quick look back to the patient's chart shows that an echo six months ago had normal RV size and function. How did these point-of-care ultrasound findings affect patient care? Well, we stopped the IV fluids due to the patient's large IVC, RV dilation, RV failure, and an RVSP of 76. The patient also underwent a CT pulmonary angiogram, which is controversial because of her creatinine, but it did show bilateral subsegmental pulmonary emboli. Cardiology was consulted, she was put on heparin, admitted, and over the course of a few weeks, she was gently diuresed and discharged home with a creatinine of 3.5. I recognize getting a CT pulmonary angiogram with a creatinine of 5.3 is controversial, but there's more and more evidence to say that contrast-induced nephropathy is not real and that we're probably just finding an association between sick people getting CT scans with contrast. Well, I know some people think it's fake and some people think it's real. Comment down below whether you would have got a CT pulmonary angiogram or a VQ scan or would have just admitted the patient. After the patient was admitted, the inpatient team found out that the patient actually had idiopathic pulmonary hypertension and was placed on Tadalafil, but the nursing home stopped giving it for unclear reasons. The patient was discharged home with a diagnosis of acute kidney injury due to volume overload and acute tubular necrosis, as well as hypoxic respiratory failure due to pulmonary emboli and stoppage of her home to Tadalafil. In summary, point-of-care ultrasound can be used to diagnose the cause of acute kidney injury. First, we'll want to rule out post-renal causes by obtaining a post-void residual view of the bladder, as well as a view of the kidneys to look for hydronephrosis. After that, we're going to do a volume status assessment for pre-renal causes by looking at the IVC, lungs, and advanced echo such as RV function and maybe diastology. Thanks for watching the video, and please consider liking the video and subscribing if you enjoy this content.